Okay, good. So, hello everyone, I'm Doug Baggett. Uh, um, I'm going to do a presentation today on BOINC, which stands for Berkeley Open Infrastructure for Network Computing. Now, what exactly is BOINC and why, uh, you know, why do we want to use it and all those other good things? Um, one second while I, while I talk, just get my outline here, which I should have up, but I want to put it on my, uh, my, my iPad here so that I can look at it from there. Um, <clears throat> So just a little bit about me. Um, I'm currently a contractor for the National Science Foundation. Uh, I work for NTT Data, uh, and I, of course I have to say uh, any opinions are my own and are uh, not uh, uh, any, any indication or views of either the National Science Foundation or NTT Data. Um, <clears throat> so about 10 or 12 years ago, I was involved uh, in NSF's Office, for Cyber, Office of Cyber Infrastructure. And one of the projects that they were, that they were funding was something called BOINC. <clears throat> BOINC is a framework to allow scientists who wish to be able to um, allow the, the, the general public to contribute computational power uh, to solve scientific problems. Now, um, where did this all start? Uh, how many of you, if any you want to speak up, are uh, familiar with uh, with SETI at home? Have any of you uh, either heard about that or run that before or run Blank before? Mm -hmm. With SETI at home. So <clears throat> SETI at home started at about the same time as another project. I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Uh, share present now. And I'm going to have to share my entire screen. So just um, uh, bear with me while I minimize things. Allow and I will minimize this. Uh, so, in the very beginning, there was SETI. Now you can see my screen, just to confirm. Yep, you can see that. Yes. So, in the very beginning, there were two, basically two standalone projects. There was SETI at home, and there was Folding at home. So, both projects actually were funded. Well, SETI at home wasn't, but Folding at home was an NSF funded project, but they were both application specific. And um, the the creator of SETI at Home, or the, the runner of SETI, SETI at Home, a, a scientist by the name of David Anderson at uh, at uh, Berkeley, um, decided that that he needed some way of managing the SETI at Home back end a little bit better. So he started developing the back end and then realized that he could create a framework to allow other scientists to be able to uh, have their own projects, but use the same infrastructure that he had developed to manage the SETI at home uh, infrastructure. And, um, and so, so that became Boink, and that became a, a, a funded project that NSF um, actually, actually gave him money to do. And uh, let me go to the Boink page here. And so uh, Boink was, was created. Now, I'm just going to minimize my outline here. So the goal uh, of Boink, of course, was to allow scientists to be able to create projects. <clears throat> the current status of Boink is as follows. So um, Boink has had funding off and on over the last 20 years. Uh, currently, it is funded um, through a new effort to make it far easier to use called uh, Science United. Um, <clears throat> excuse me for coughing. Um, it was recognized that it's far, it's far too difficult for the general public to be able to use Boink. It is, it really is much more. Once you see it, you'll understand what I mean. Uh, it is um, much more oriented towards the power user. So they created a, a, a new funding effort to be able to create to make it much easier for the public to be able to use, called Science United. And Science United is basically another application that sits on top of Boink, <clears throat> which makes it easier for um, for the public to use. So how does Boink work? So I bring up here. So this is, uh, now this wiki page, which I will be providing uh, a list of links for everyone to go, really does provide a lot of, a lot of different information about how it works. Um, you know, you have your PC and you have individual project servers. Now these are servers that each individual project that scientists have set up have uh, have set up in order to be able to distribute the data for uh, for 
to be uh, computationally worked on. And as you can see, it's a pretty easy thing. It's a you know, basic, it's a basic client server model, you know, where you know you have instructions, where applications and input files are downloaded. Uh, your PC computes on them, and then the upload files are outputted, and then of course the results are outputted. Um, and we don't have to go down through this too much, but uh, every time you 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 do uh, you report a result, you get credit, um, and that kind of gives you a score, which is aggregated together and uh, and attributed to both yourself and a team if you're a part of that team. Uh, this kind of it kind of explains a little bit more. Uh, how it works. There's, as part of the client, as part of the, the software, there's basically two parts. There's what's called a core client and a GUI. Now the GUI um, isn't really a GUI anymore because because it, it doesn't just refer to uh, a graphical user interface. It's it's more a, a Boink manager because there's curses versions for use uh, on the command line. Uh, there's also just a straight command line version. In the very, very beginning, when I first started it, you could run the core client, and you actually can still run the core client as a standalone executable and do everything you want from there. But there were some security issues with that, and so it's far more difficult to do that. Um, you have to mess around with permission, with file permissions in order to get it to work just as a standalone client. So what they did was they, they packaged it up so that the core client now runs for the most part as a daemon. Um, and when you install either from the Debian uh, repositories or from uh, the RPM repositories, it's now usually installed, uh, actually it just it is installed as a, uh, a, a daemon that runs in the background. And then the, the, uh, the Boink manager uh, then communicates directly to that uh, via RPC. Um, you can also use the GUI or the Boink manager to talk to other uh, Boink core clients that might be operating uh, on a network that is accessible to you. So for instance, in my room here, I have one, two, three, four, five, uh, six computers running, and I can use the core client in order to be able, I can use the, the manager, sorry, to talk to the core clients of any one of those computers if I want to, instead of SSH in, SSHing into them or VNCing into them and actually doing that. Um, so, and by the way, if anyone has any questions, please just chime in. Don't uh, don't let me just drone on forever. If you have any if you have any questions, just please uh, please uh, say so. Um, so um, once so, where do we go from here? So I guess let me just go over a little bit about how you choose a project before I show you how you install it. So, if you go to the website here and you see science projects and you click on that. This shows you all of the different projects that are available. And each one of these, of course, are this. And some of them, and they all have different aims. And some are, are more than just a single scientific project. Uh, and I'm gonna go over that in just a moment. But you see the supported platforms on the right-hand side. It's very important that you pay attention to that when you are selecting a project. As you can see, it shows the different platforms that it supports and also the different the, also the different architectures. So you'll notice on amicable numbers, the very top, you'll see that there's both a Linux and a Linux ARM. So that basically means that it supports both Intel-based Linux, uh, Linux distributions that have that package. Uh, well, uh, you, can, you can get it from their repositories. You can also download it from source if you want. Um, and also it supports ARM-based uh, Linux distributions. So uh, Raspbian, uh, running on a Raspberry Pi is supported by amicable numbers. Some of them do not do that. Um, also, it supports NVIDIA for GPU and Radeon uh, for uh, AMD. Um, so in this particular um, thing, it supports, uh, what's the NVIDIA part of, what's the NVIDIA GPU uh, subsystem called? Ah, I can't remember. Well, anyway, uh, you can see that it supports both of those. So. If you have a, a GPU video card available and you've got the drivers installed, it will the uh, the uh, core client will detect that. And if the project is providing compute jobs that can take advantage of those, it will occur. Um, if you look at, a little further down, you'll see both Android. So Android is supported. iOS, of course, is not supported. We don't care about that. Of course, we're, this is a Linux user group, so all we care about is, is about Linux. Um, some of the other projects include the VirtualBox icon. Now, why would they why would they do that? So, uh, in some of the projects like Blink Attack, which I'll talk about, Cosmology at Home, 
and also some like LHC at home, which is the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Um, because their projects are, are how do I call it? Because they've they've built their own Linux, they've built their applications to run on on a homegrown Linux distribution. Uh, what they've done is is they've packaged that distribution up in a version in VirtualBox, and VirtualBox can be hooked into uh, the Boink client in order to be able to run that. Now you might ask yourself, well, you know, why doesn't it use QEMU? or Docker or any of those other ones, you have to remember that Blink has been around for longer than Docker and longer you know, than a lot of the virtualization technologies. So um, Blink is kind of behind really in the use of those particular technologies. And I think they are working on it. So that's kind of like why you would see the virtual box there. Uh, it also supports Intel OpenCL. So Minecraft at home, I've never actually run that one, but it is there, uh, uses uh, the Intel OpenCL. Um, and if you can scroll down and you can choose all these different projects. A couple of uh, more things before I get off of this. Some of these projects, like I said, are multiple science. So Blink Attack is an interesting project. It's actually not a single project, but the, the, the Blink project hooks into the greater uh, grid infrastructure that is connected to the NSF grid um, uh, environment uh, that that spans the United States and uh, jobs can migrate their their way from that environment to Blink Attack and then from Blink Attack to you. Uh, also, the World Community Grid, if I can scroll down here, uh, which is uh, uh, um, it's it's sponsored by IBM, uh, allows you. It's actually a meta a meta project. So when you join the World Community Grid, when, and I won't go to that website since that's the one I'm involved with, uh, allows you to choose eight or nine different scientific projects, and you and you can prioritize which projects you want to to join within the World Community Grid. Uh, so it's kind of it's kind of a meta project. Uh, a lot of people don't do Community Grid. They might just choose individual projects and prioritize them within the blank client instead of using World Community Grid and then prioritizing it within that. So I've kind of thrown a lot uh, at you in that, but just know that you, know, you, you need to go to this page. You need to look at each one, find out which particular project uh, suits your needs and your goals, and then, and then kind of choose that. That's really the way to go about doing it. Um, let's see here. So I guess what I'll do is next on my list of things is actually to go to World Community Grid to kind of show you uh, what it is that, uh, how it works, because that's what I use. Um, so the World Community Grid, and let me just hold a second here while I, I go back to, give me a moment. I'm going to stop sharing my screen for one moment while I do a password get. Should have had this entered when I. Um, And if it seems like I'm jumping around uh, around all over the place, or if there's some if there's an area that you'd like to hear about first, like for instance, if you say, "Hey, Doug, I don't want to I don't want to hear about the World Community Grid until you show me how uh, how to actually run the client," we could do that first. If not, I will uh, I will ignore your silent pleas and uh, just proceed. But um, let me just go ahead and bring it back here and. Share my screen, present now, and your entire screen. And you can see it again, I'm assuming. Yes. Thank you. OK, so uh, in the World Community Grid, you have you can choose your project. Now I'm going to show you just a little bit about my particular con contribution to show you how many computers, these are all the computers that I have actually running, well, actually or have run in the last 30 days or so, and when they've updated and how many, the, how many points have been generated and how many actual results have been, have been returned 
And then you can drill down, for instance, MX Linux. So this kind of shows me how many results per day that it's going back. So it's kind of neat. And this, this kind of shows me the number of results uh, per day that I've been done. So kind of gives you an idea within this project uh, how I'm doing. And then this shows me the actual projects that I'm involved in. Now I could choose any one of these projects while joined to the World Community Grid, but I've chosen because I wanna feel like I'm kind of helping the pandemic, I've chosen that I only wanna do the open pandemics, which is COVID-19 uh, um, uh, treatments. So this particular project, what they do is they're looking for um, uh, drugs that are already available that uh, can help with COVID-19. So it's kind of a kind of a neat thing. And then my team, I don't think I have a team set up, or actually I think I do, the Stafford World Community Grid team. Uh, I was thinking of actually starting a Fredlog team. So if anyone's interested in that, I can do that too. And you can actually find a team if you want and you can actually join them in any of a number of countries. Um, teams are usually restricted to the particular project, either this one or to uh, another one like like uh, where is it? Well, SETI is SETI is actually shut down. You see, they're no longer no longer distributing tasks. But Boink Attack or the Large Hadron Collider, each of them has their own teams. There is a such thing as what's called a Meta Boink team, but it was it became some sort of a security issue. So in order to do a Meta Boink team, you have to email Dr. Anderson directly before he'll create one for you. Um, but anyway, so. Within the World Community Grid, let me go ahead and bring it back. If I can find it wherever it is. So within the World Community Grid, you can go ahead and you can join from there. Now, at this point, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna explain uh, briefly how you install it. And then I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to share my, my MX uh, Linux uh, uh, screen and show you the, the interface so you can kind of get an idea as to what I'm talking about because it's kind of hard to to get an idea unless you you, know, you kind of know what um, what I'm what I'm talking about or saying um, so let me go ahead and share stop sharing and start sharing a window and share MX Linux and allow and do all of you see my MX Linux screen? Yes. Okay, good. All right, so this is the Boink Manager. Now, when you install Boink, either via, via either RPM or via, um, or via the, uh, 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 the, the apt repositories or eMerge or Pac-Man or from source, uh, you will have a Boink client. Now, it doesn't look like this initially. It looks, they actually have two views. They have a simple view, which looks like this, and then they have the advanced view. Now, for our purposes, I'm going to I'm going to use the advanced view uh, because that really is where uh, you know you, you get the most control and you can see what's going on. So, uh, in order to get to the advanced view, you can go to advanced view. You can also there's also skins you can install. So you know if you want it to look differently, you can. And this kind of gives you a preview uh, on the uh, symbol view as to what your screensaver would look like if you have that set up. So let me go to uh oh, did it crash? I think it did. That's not a good view. Let's see here, view, advanced view. There we go. Okay, so when you first start up the Boink Manager, you're gonna see uh, a bunch of tabs. First is your notices, just kind of gives you uh, news. Like if, for, for instance, a particular project wants you to change the URL and I'll, you'll see what this means when I uh, join a, uh, I'm gonna join a new project to show you how it's done. They might give you some more information. This is a, this is, this is the, the, the notification window where you might see this. TAC basically changed the, the old URL that you use in order to join the project from uh, when you go through the wizard to join the project. So this is just kind of informing you of that. This is the projects I'm actually installed, that I'm actually uh, involved in. And you can see I have three different projects. I'm actually only running run one right now, uh, but you can actually see, you can actually go to each one and you can actually look at the properties for each project. And it kind of tells you a little bit about uh, kind of what you saw on that web page that I was showing you. And then it gives you uh, a little bit more information about uh, kind of the, the current status of the, um, of the project and its resource share. And I'll go over that in just a moment. 
uh, and then you can remove a project and then you can actually get to the home page of each project from the interface. So it kind of makes it a little bit easier, uh, which is nice. Um, now the tasks actually show you the tasks that are actually running. So uh, in this particular case, um, in this particular case, I only have one task running and you can see that uh, it's a COVID-19 open pandemics application. And it's actually running at, uh, well, it's 94% complete. Um, and it's only running on one core and that's because I don't wanna overheat my laptop. Um, but you can, this is where you'd see it. And you can see that there's a whole bunch of other tasks that are queued up and ready to go. Uh, also, you can see these are other tasks from other projects. When I stopped running the other projects, uh, any tasks that I had sitting in here, uh, they, um, they abort if they're not done by a particular deadline. And that's, the deadline is important to know in case you uh, have computers that are not on the network all the time. Uh, so you know uh, when they're gonna be done. If they're on the network all the time, you don't really have to worry about it that much. But it's kind of, it's, this is very good information. This kind of tells you how long it takes before the, the project, that particular task will end. Transfers, uh, you don't see anything now here because there are no, there is nothing transferring. When there is something transferring, you will see it along with uh, how fast it's transferring. This is could be anything from the application itself to actual tasks. This shows you the statistics for the project that you have selected. Let me go back to, well, let me go back here. So I'll choose uh, World Community Grid. This kind of shows me a little about the statistics for the tasks. And this shows me the disk usage for Boink. Uh, so those are the tabs. Uh, if we go to view, uh, that just kind of shows you the same place before. Activity. So this is kind of interesting. So you see where it says run always, run based on preferences, suspend. So this is something that you'll want to become familiar with. Run always obviously is run always, run all the time. Boink is always nice. It's nice at the highest level. It's nice at 19. Uh, so you'll, you know, if, if you have anything running, um, it will run at a low priority. Um, run based on preferences. So each project has its own web-based preferences. Now, um, if I click that, what it will do is it will try to run on those preferences, on those on those web web-based preferences. Or will it? Let me think for a moment. Uh, let me just go here for a second. Yeah, so you can say preferences, but if let me go back here and show you what I just showed you. So over here you have computing preferences. You can see it says using local preferences. So you can choose from here the number of CPUs, the number of CPU time, whether or not you want it to suspend on battery, whether or not you want to suspend it within use, what in use means, whether or not you want to suspend the, the uh, Boink when anything other than Boink is running over a certain percentage point, and then how many days of storage you want to be, how many uh, how many days of of work you want to store. Um, just because you you can put up to fourteen, but each project in the back end has its own individual limits. So uh, your you know what you actually get and what you put down there may vary. Uh, you have the same thing for network where you can limit your up your up and down link disk and memory, schedules. So like if you only wanted to run this between the hours of 11 at night and six in the morning, you could do that. So it gives you a lot of flexibility. Now you see where it says you're using local prefs. Um, let me go back for a second. Um, well, let me just ask, does anyone have any questions or does anyone uh, have any comments that you'd like to ask about before I continue? Because I've kind of thrown a lot at you and I don't want to continue if there's any questions that you might have. I can't see them either because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm full screen. Can someone uh, maybe read the chat out to me and I'll... Do they let you know how your computer power helps with the project? Yes, they do. So let me go back. Let's see here. Let me go ahead and stop sharing. And let me go back to the World Community Grid to kind of show you uh, how they do that. So each project does it uh, in their own way. Second, share now. Sharing a Google Meet is like a four step process. All right, so let me go back to the World Community Grid. So. 
uh, if you go to news, for instance, here, <clears throat> so as you can see that for each of the different projects, they actually provide uh, news. So here's the January, February op update for COVID-19. And this kind of exp explains uh, some projects are far more brief than others. So this particular project, they've chosen to be very at a very high level because they didn't want to get into the nitty gritty of how they're looking at individual full, uh, proteins. Uh, some projects are more, some are less. This particular project does it every single uh, uh, does it every single month. So it kind of tells you. So in this particular one, they've said that in late 2020, researchers announced they had selected 70 compounds that could be uh, promised to investigate as uh, potential inhibitors of the virus. And open pandemics, the COVID-19 app is what identified those 70 compounds. So you actually can see that your work actually had, uh, and you know, it actually helped a little bit. You look at the childhood, uh, childhood cancer. So this kind of explained, uh, what they were doing this month. So, you know, it's not like you're just computing and you just don't know, uh, you know, you don't, you don't know what's going on. It actually does. Now I will say some are more, some will tell you more, some will tell you less. So, you know, you may be happy or disappointed at the, at the amount of, uh, of, of feedback or news that they provide. Um, also, um, so many of the sites have their own forums. Let's see if I can find it. My contribution, where is it, where is it, where is it? Community, where is it? It's really a forum somewhere. Well, anyway, each site has its own forum and you can see, uh, you know, you can see what you can, so you can ask people what's going on. Um, it's kind of interesting to kind of see, this is uh, kind of results from my different computers. Uh, what's the next question on the list? Any any other ones, or is, was that the only one? Anything else, Pete? Yeah, so, Doug, it looks like the rest of them are just um, comments. How do you think this is really cool? The unused processing power of my personal computers at home. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so that's the positive side. Let me tell you the negative side of it. Um, and this was going to be at the very end, but I'm going to put this right now. So two things that have become very um, uh, front and center for people thinking about contributing their computers is heat and electricity cost, uh, especially as, as, uh, as climate change and those types of considerations have become front and center for some people. Uh, the question is, all right, you know, I don't know if any of you are familiar with, obviously, I think you're probably familiar with Bitcoin, but one of the, one of the, um, one of the things that, that people hate about Bitcoin is that it uses so much electricity, um, you know, that it's, you know, it's using a lot of power, you know, that, you know, that, you know, there's, lot, there's coal or nuclear or whatever is being used. Uh, of course, they consider Bitcoin. A lot of people don't consider Bitcoin to be of any value. Uh, this is obviously provides some value to scientists for doing work. So that has to be a consideration when you are doing this. Um, I will say this much though: um, the electricity costs and the heating issues are less of a problem in the winter time than it is in the summertime. And the reason why is because if you think about it, as you're running your computer in your house in the winter time, um, it's actually heating your house. Uh, now it's not as efficient as your heat pump, or your gas, or your gas heater, but there is a significant offset, so that the uh, so that the amount of electricity uh, that you're that you're paying uh, isn't gonna isn't gonna skyrocket your you know your electricity bill. Now that being said, the summertime is a whole different story, because uh, you know now you're you're running your AC, your AC has to fight your computers putting out all that heat. Um, in my room right now, in my den. It's 80 degrees, so uh, you know that's kind of toasty. <laughs> um, you know, it, and uh, you know, I, I keep my door shut to keep my to keep my the the kids' uh, school learning uh, from interfering with work. And uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, it's not uh, exactly that comfortable, but uh, it's definitely toasty. So that is something you do have to consider. Um, you know, I have not noticed a huge increase in my electrical bills. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, here's the thing, you know, if you're running a project that uses your GPU uh, and it's using your CPU, you know, you, you, 
people's power supplies, two, three, four, five, eight hundred watt power supply. You can, you can start, you know, you can start really, you know, cranking out some electricity. You know, if you've got that thing running, say, all the time, uh, you know, just just running twenty four seven. So um, it's something to consider. Um, I have all of I have a lot of old computers running because I don't believe that anything, I I have this thing about about old computers and not wanting them to go to you go to waste. And I also have every old Android tablet, an old uh, uh, um, Amazon Fire tablet that my kids have dis have discarded, uh, plugged into a ten port USB hub, all just cranking away doing their thing. I figured when they die, they die. But in the meantime, they can they can crank out. Uh, uh, you know, research, even if it's just one unit per day, uh, compared to say uh, 10 or 15 or 50 that a computer that a, a PC would do. So um, I hope that um, I hope that that adds some uh, some information to uh, to uh, a little bit about um, about um, uh, consideration for how to do it. Um, one more thing too. So let me show you a little bit. Uh, so I, I showed you this this particular. Can you all still see my screen? It's going to be a little bit smaller because you know. So that, that I'm using X11 VNC and it's only 1376 by or 13 something by 768. So yeah. I'm sharing the whole screen. But what I wanted, but rather than than stop sharing and start sharing, I just want to show you something real quick. Um, hey, Doug, so you, you do have more questions as well. Oh, go ahead. Well, what other do questions are there? Not a VM. Uh, you know what? Um, I have run it within a VM. And you can run it within a VM. Um, you're good. There is. You're going to be constrained in in regards to uh, running uh, GPU jobs, but there's no problem with running it in a VM. And in fact, you can you could run it within Docker if you wanted to. Um, I've seen some people who have done it. Um, you know, it's not it's not an issue. Uh, in running it in a VM, and of course, like I said, those two projects, like like Blink Attack, and also the Large Hadron Collider (LHC) at home, actually run their jobs within a VM that that is controlled by the Blink the Blink process. So, you know, it, it's it's not unusual to do that. Um, if you go ahead, are there any restrictions on the GPU pass through to either Docker or the or the virtual machine? I don't think so. Um, you know what? I'm not as familiar with doing GPU pass through. I haven't actually had to try that yet. Um, the only, the most powerful GPU that I have that is compatible with Blink is running in my Windows box. So I would need to. I mean, there are ways to do GPU pass through. I do not know whether or not. You know, it all depends on how on how OpenCL interacts with that. Um, but yeah, I would say it's something worth looking into. I'll actually look into that. That's actually a, an interesting uh, question to ask. Um, and of course, there are forums you can ask. If you go to the Boink webpage site, the, the, the main Boink page, there is a forum where you can po post any question you want. Uh, before I go on, I just want to say that there is a curses command line version of the client called Boink TUI. And uh, I use this a lot when I'm when I don't, you know, when I'm doing SSH or uh, when I, I just want to run a system headless. And it's basically the same thing as the Boink client GUI, but it's all within the, you know, within, you know, a curses interface, which is really quite nice. And it will tell you, you know, kind of show you what you want to do. But I, so I wanted to show you that it is called Boink TUI in case you want to use that. Um, that way you don't have to run the main client and run it on X if you want. So uh, that is quite useful. This did not exist in the very beginning. In the very beginning, when I first first started Boink, I was doing it all command line. And it was a pain in the butt. And this makes it a whole lot easier. Um, what other um, questions might there be? Yeah. Um, are you having any issues with Max overheating? You know what? So the I laptops. have I have underneath, if you see my 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 laptop to my, I guess it's to my left. Uh, on the right, uh, you probably don't you know, on my little picture. I've got a 2015 MacBook Pro running a Core i7, and underneath that, I have an old Core 2 Duo. Um, you know, when you run this thing at full tilt, you know it's not unusual for me to see my Mac uh, run at uh, seeing the cores at like 85 degrees C, which is pretty hot. <laughs> you know, uh, 
the Core 2 Duo has been running nonstop for three years without any problems. So, um, you know, of course, I don't care about it because it's, it's a Core 2 Duo that's a system that's no longer supported by Apple uh, operating system wise. And I can't load Linux on it because the keyboard is busted. I spilled some water on it. So I can't actually boot off of USB. Um, because you need to use the, the actual keyboard instead of a connected USB keyboard. So it's a pain in the butt. So yeah, um, laptops are a consideration. Um, on my pad, I have a T420 that's running on this MX laptop. Um, if I go to, let me go ahead and bring up here, you're asking about, about overheating. Um, let me just look here for a second. So you know, you'll see right now that it's running at about 50 degrees C. If I run, if I if I jack that up to if I go up to here and I go up to uh, computing preferences and I change that to 100% of the CPUs, my little Core 2 Duo, uh, well, my Core 2 Duo, the MX Linux, the MX uh, ThinkPad T420, which is running like a Core i5, or is it Core i3? I think it's Core i3. Uh, will get to I don't know. I mean, it can be. It'll it'll get the it can get to 80 degrees C or 85 degrees C. Uh, which is uh, pretty pretty hot, and um, I do want that laptop to to last a little bit longer. Now that being said, you know all modern processors will 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 clock down if they get too hot. You know, um, you know they, they they will they will throttle themselves back. It's not a situation they want to be in, but they will. Um, has anyone ever had a processor die due to heat? I've never ever in my life had a processor die because it overheated for too long. Has anyone ever actually had that happen to you? Yeah. Is that because of is that because of like like was that like recently or just like way back in the 90s when like they would like melt on the motherboard? Was yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the the cooling is not is not the greatest in the world. I mean, you know, the you know, the the T420 doesn't doesn't cool near as well as I as I would like it to. So, that's why I kind of had that that one scale back a little bit. You know, I I just I'd like it to last a little bit longer. Um, you know, and you kind of have to pay play around with the number of CPUs because you have to remember you have number of cores and you have number of of threads. So, you know, 25% of the, if you put 50% of the CPUs, you know, you may not, you may not actually see this temperature drop unless you go down to 25%. Uh, or you may not see any, if you go from 50 to 75%, you may not see any difference in the, uh, in the temperature at all because the processes are running on two cores, even though they're not running all the threads they would normally run. So uh, it's just something you need to pay, play around with. The CPU time kind of is a little bit different where it kind of stops and then starts, then stops and starts, then stops and starts. So that's a little bit different than, than actually controlling the number of CPUs or CPU cores that are available. Um, any other, uh, any next question? Any, anything else that you, since I can't actually see what's on the chat line. Yeah, man, just speak up. No shy people here. <laughs> Maybe we should require that everyone have at least two drinks before joining the, the Fred Lodge. No, 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 nothing else. <laughs> done. No. I have to move it to an evening meeting then. Exactly. <laughs> Besides, you don't want to hear me drunk. I, I talk enough as is. You have no idea. What... <laughs> My cap house, yeah. Oh, yeah, we man. used to uh, we used to meet at the library, and if if we didn't have a, a topic worth discussing or the meeting ended early, uh, we would just walk from the library to Capitol Ale House and continue our meeting there. <laughs> so, so does anyone have any questions before I actually go through the process of doing? Because I've uh, I've gone on for I've droned on for forty five minutes, and I really want to show you guys how you how you join a project. Hey, you're doing great, Doug. Go ahead and All keep right. All right, so so here's how you join a project. You say add project. All right, so it may, they do make it easy for you. So you can see here's all the different projects involved. So I need to join one that I've not joined before. Actually, I'm going to join one. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to join one, and um, uh, I'm going to uh, use a 
maybe a new email address. So, so I'm going to choose Asteroids at Home. So Asteroids at Home. So this is kind of an interesting project. So it, it aims to map all the asteroids or near Earth objects, NEOs, all around space and with the goal of maybe knowing which ones might eventually crash into our planet and kill us all. So, you know, maybe that's a good thing. Uh, or you never know, uh, you know, maybe this will provide a map for mining the asteroid belt at some point. Um, uh, you know, so that, you know, when we finally get out to, to mining it, you know, we'll know where they all are. So here's the project URL. Here's what I was talking about before. Every project has its own URL and it's all done via, via, uh, um, you know, HTTP, via traditional web, uh, protocol. So, uh, I'm going to choose asteroids at home. I'm going to do next. And it's going to start, as you can see, like that. So let's go ahead and do a new user. Now, uh, because I have my own domain, I'm going to go ahead. I've created one called boink at uh, bagot.info. And I'm going to just create a password. One second. And we'll see if this works. Oh, wait, I did existing user. I need to go back. Sorry. Uh, try again. So asteroids at home. Next. And no one caught that. Can you believe that? You guys just you just let me do that all on my own. Let's see here. Uh, Dan, you should have said something. Something at least. <laughs> I say this would be. So let me say next. Uh-oh. Please try again later. Well, let me try another one. So that's one thing you will find. Some of these projects are, um, some of them uh, may be down in maintenance and the project list isn't always updated all the time. So, so uh, I'm joining right now a different one called uh, Einstein at Home. Einstein uh, is looking for down in Louisiana and other places. Um, so um, I be blanket back at info. We really need to get you a, a password manager. You can just cut and paste. Well, I, I do. I do. But you know, I'm on my Mac. I use one password for the Mac. And um, the VNC on my Mac doesn't, uh, for some reason, the clipboard is not, clipboard support is not very um, um, robust, I think I would say. All right, well, that's nice. So I'm being thwarted, but I'm gonna find a project to do. So uh, they want you to register on the website. Well, at least they told me, that's good. Let me try one more time. Oh, let's choose, uh... Milky Way at home. There we go. That's simulating the galaxy. It's a Rensselaer Institute in Germany. This is actually mapping the stars in the universe. So, if this doesn't work, I'm going to scream. Ah, there we go. Yay. Okay. So now, and then it redirects me and says, okay, I want to call myself. Doug Boink. And okay, that's nice. Speaking of one password. All right, I'm not going to join a team right now, but you can. You could if you wanted to. But before we do that, let me go ahead and minimize this and bring back. So you can see it's giving me some interesting stuff. So See the tasks here. So let me see if we can transfer and go to projects. So I'm gonna I'm going to um, suspend the world community grid, and I'm going to just do update here because I want to see what's going on here. We can go to our event log. So you can see here. Here's the project. You can see the communication has started. So it got one task. It started download of the application here, as you can see. And start to download a text file. I don't know why, but it has. But you can do that. And then we go back to, 
Let's see here, tools. I'm gonna do run always. And where's tasks? Sorry, transfer is no tan. So you can see it's already started, it already has started downloading and running. That's that's all you really need to do. There's really nothing about to it. Now we kind of missed the, the downloads uh, on this her, on, on this area, but that's all you need to do. Uh, there's nothing else to it. And you know, you can you can change the resource share of the different projects. So you could say, I want this one 25%, I want this one 25%. I'm trying to remember how you do it. You can also do some interesting things too. You can say, uh, you can suspend the processor when a particular application or suspend the GPU when a particular application is running in the background. So like for instance, let's say you have a video game you're playing and you don't want it running while Boink is running. You could actually stick it in there. Um, let's see here, what else? Account manager, what is an account manager? So I did not go over that and I probably should. So there is a such thing as called meta account managers. And what you can do is you can join Let's see if I can find my account manager. One second. Give me one moment. Account managers. So Science United is actually an account manager, but there's other ones called uh, the Boink account manager, if we click on that. So this is actually allows you to control many different projects and many different clients at a single time. So what you would do is you would go back to your, to your client. You would say, I wanna add an account manager. And you can see here they are, the different types of Boink managers. And then you can use that as kind of a meta way to like to to manage all of your different projects at a single at a single uh, swipe, or all of your different uh, clients at a single swipe. So let's say you have, and I mean there are people who have thousands of computers running, so they need this sort of manager in order to be able to manage all of the different clients that might be running. So I, I'm not going to go into that in detail, but if you want more information, you can go to these websites. Uh, and you can actually see them. Uh, if I go down to, uh, where is it? If I go down to active projects in the Boink Manager, you can see, I'll give you all the different, so you can see here there are 31 teraflops of combined Boink computational stuff going on across the various stats. You can see, um, I guess it's, it's waiting a moment here. Takes a while to compute this. Here's the different people, and you can, you know, you can see what they're doing and the countries that they're doing from. They're doing from. You can see the host operating system breakdown. Windows is the top, followed by Linux, and then various versions of Windows, various versions of Mac OS, uh, you know, and whatnot. So it's kind of interesting to see this stuff. So. Uh, also give you the type of CPUs that are being used. We have Intel, we have Ryzen, we have AMD. I don't see any uh, ARM there, but there, there are, I guess you can, you can sort it. So it's kind of an interesting, oh, well, there's a, there's an ARM, there's an ARM one right there. And here's ARM right here. So there's 2,581 ARM processors, you know, processing it. So does anyone have any other questions? I've kind of run it. Well, let me do one more thing. Um, looking at my, looking at my, uh, um, my spreadsheet, my little notes here. Um, for most, um, most of the configuration, once you've installed, once you've installed, uh, um, ah, wrong password, hold a second. Ah, how embarrassing. So most of the um, most of the configuration for the before the core client is uh, in the Etsy Boink client. If you're installing it from the uh, um, from the repositories, uh, there's a couple of different files I want to point out. If you do want to do remote uh, um, remote control of Boink, so you know when I went when we went back before, where is the Boink client? One second. Did I, did I close it? I don't think I did. 
Hold a second. Well, anyway, in the in the uh, in the in the uh, uh, the GUI that I was showing you, you can connect to any of your different computers on your network. I was mentioning that earlier. These two files right here: GUI RPC auth CFG, uh, CFG and remote host CFG. This first one is a password that you would need to put, or you can make it blank. The second one, uh, you actually can put in uh, individual IP addresses that are authorized to be able to connect to the core client. I just wanted to point those two out because they're in my notes here. And um, you know, if you want to be able to, uh, you know, to control more than one, uh, more than one core client without SSHing into it, you need to be able to be familiar with those two. And of course, the other two files are XML files with the prefs. Um, you don't have to mess with those; those are controlled by the client itself. So I wouldn't worry about those too much. Um, but um, you know, if you want, if you want to know what to do on those, that's kind of Kind of interesting to know. Um, any other questions before I stop and just say, hey, you know, ask any more questions? Why is this not running? Sure, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I talked about the new, so the new, are you, are you, are you asking, are the projects themselves doing outreach? Is that what you're asking? You know, well, you know, I mean, you know, so, you know, IBM, you know, your, you know, Red Hat's parent company, I guess now, um, you know, they've been, they've been supporting the World Community Grid project, which is, you know, one of the projects there. Um, I don't know, I don't know what their, their outreach, um, I don't know what they've been doing to do outreach. Um, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. I guess the answer to that is I don't know what their outreach is. I, I would hope that they are doing some. Um, you know, the, the idea of, of volunteer computing has been around for a while. Um, there's about 300,000 people participants in Boink right now. Um, now that doesn't include the folding at home people, which are separate, since folding at home does not use Boink. Um, there was at about 500,000 people, so the amount of people have actually gone down over time, even though the number of computational resources or you know the, the amount of uh, cpu time has gone up uh, over the years um if we go to where is the, there was actually a let me see if i can find it here there was actually a um computing power here so you can see right here you know what you know the amount of of comp computing power across all the projects that have been used you see it's almost you know almost 300,000 computers and 80,000 people um, and of course, you know, and they, 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 they feature a particular volunteer and you can see the top volunteers here. So, you know, that's a good question, you know, Peter, I don't know what it is. I mean, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this on Fredlog, Fredlog was I wanted, you know, to spread the news to allow, you know, to, so that you all can maybe tell other people about it. I, I would like to see more organizations you know, maybe run the software. Now, security guys, uh, when, I, when I brought this up to, to my security people at NSF, I would say, hey guys, you know, NSF funds this. We should run this on all of our compu desktop computers in the background. Of course, you know, uh, security guys, they just started, they started foaming at the mouth and they just started shaking their head left and right, like, you know, and they started shaking. I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of joking, but you, you get what I'm trying to say when it comes to getting this past security to run this stuff on any large, you know, organization or corporation. You know, unless they haven't, unless they haven't vetted it, you know, they're 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 very Reddit. They, they just they're just so scared they don't want to run it. Uh, and of course, there was a, the additional problem of the National Science Foundation running the software because uh, although the although we fund Boink, we don't fund all of the individual projects. Some of them we do. Some of them we fund the um, 
the uh, the the LIGO experiment, the LIGO project, which is Einstein at home. So the question was, well, if we run Boink on our computers, which projects would we join? And I and then they said, well, if we did do it, we we really would have to be careful because you know there are rules about about you know providing you know uh, resources, non grant grantee resources to organizations that NSF hasn't given awards to, uh, or maybe they have awards to, and this wasn't part of the grant that, that we gave them. So, you know, they just kind of looked at me and said, yeah, nice idea, Doug, but we're not going to do it. So, but, you know, but I asked anyway, and I was hoping that what I could do, and that what I would do is, um, you know, that, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, what I could do is, is kind of show it to you all, and uh, who knows, maybe, Maybe, you know, we could, um... now, why did it say I'm still presenting? I, I don't see your screen anymore. There it is, it take, just takes a moment. Um, you know, so, you know, this is kind of, uh, kind of what I wanted to show you guys. I know I kind of threw a lot at you, but, um, you know, it is an interesting project. And, you know, if you've got spare computers running in the background, you know, running, doing nothing. You know, this is a great little thing to just run in the background. You know, um, provided you don't mind the heat, provided you don't mind the electricity, and provided you know you don't mind whatever stress it might put on your computer. Uh, you know, it's not a big deal. Um, they they don't take that much memory. They don't take that much disk space. You can control that if you want. So it's not. And bandwidth. It really. What'd you say? Yeah. Let me let me show you, let me share my screen again and just show you something. So that was something I was going to go over that I forgot about about project requirements. Um, there is there is project requirements which is uh, good to know. Uh, let me go back to the user manual and system requirements. So. Now this is the base system requirements for just running Boink, not the projects themselves, not the projects themselves. So this is good to know. Yes, it does. Well, well, well. Remember, remember that Boink first was the code first came out in 2000, so that's over 20 years ago. Okay. Now remember, this does not mean the projects themselves. It's just the framework. If you want to run the individual projects, you know, you need to be able to run, let me just see if it goes down here. Uh, see what it says, point based projects may have additional requirements. It's like, uh, you know, uh, batteries not included. You know, uh, so here's, the, now this this particular chart is out of date and it's, it, but it might give you a little bit of an idea as to the, the kind of RAM uh, that it, that it, you know that it might take. So, so client prediction uses you know 1.5 gigabyte. Um, now that's usually per task. You know, so if you're running it on four cores, it might use 1.5 gig per per core. Um, but I, but climateprediction.net is kind of unique in that it's doing a full planet like weather simulation per task. Whereas you look at Einstein at home, which is fairly small. You look at some of the ones that are more math oriented, like SIMAP, I think that's a math one, it only uses 64 megabytes. So, you know, if you go to each of the websites, they do have, and you, and you look at their, their requirements. Let me see if I can't, let me go to look at this project right here. Maybe, maybe it'll show, let's see if it shows. This is the Milky Way at Home one, kind of explaining what they're doing and how they're looking for, uh, for stars and galaxies, uh, see they're much more, much more detailed in how they're using the data and how it's how it's computing. Let me. Let's go to their message boards. Maybe it'll maybe they'll explain. So here's so here's one updated GP requirements. So this one kind of gives you, you know. What kind of GPU requirements, you know, and 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 how much uh, does it say how much memory? Some of them say how much memory. So sometimes you've got to dig, 
you know, for, for the requirements, if you want to know beforehand, generally most people, what I do is I just download the project and just see what it's, what it, see what it's gobbling up, you know, and then if it's gobbling up too much, then I just, I'll just leave the project. But um, does that kind of answer your question, Peter, about, about requirements? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Well, you know, and, and not everyone has a bunch of old spare computers lying around. Maybe you just have one, you know, or maybe you just have one core lying around. You know, the, you, can, you can allocate as much or as little as you want. And that's really what's important. You know, it's just, uh, you know, you, you know it's, it's there for you to, to do if you want or not. Uh, no, one's, no one thinks less of anyone for not contributing to a particular project. Um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's kind of a, an interesting way of, uh, of utilizing your computer for maybe something other than, than, uh, than trying to, to mine Bitcoin. Although nowadays, uh, no one mines Bitcoin on computers anymore because all the, the big miners are using custom ASICs. But, um, you know, it's kind of an interesting, uh, uh, I, I, you know, it makes me feel good about using my computers for something else other than just, uh, you know, sitting there idle in addition to me playing around with, uh, you know, you know, say, you know, Docker or a couple of VMs or just playing around with it. So, but uh, that's all I have to talk about for right now. Um, any other questions you might have? Well, maybe I can look at the chat window. I'm surprised that um, it doesn't run on, run on Chromebooks. Um, that's a very good question. You know what? Um, I think it's the reason why is because it requires you to run an executable. You know, and, and there's no, um, I don't know. I think that, that the security requirements um, don't allow you to run Blink in its current form. Um, you know, it's interesting. Um, I, uh, I wanted to be able to run Blink in a non, so if you want to run it in a non install, wait, how do I say this? When you install a Blink, obviously it installs the client as root. You know, as as any because it runs as a daemon in the background, or or does it, or does it create a user? It might actually create a user. I can't remember, but it has to have root privileges in order to do what it needs to do. And um, I think that probably is part of it. Um, it is possible to run it in a non-root environment, but it's much more difficult. You know, you have to run it on the command line on your own. You have to launch it on your own. In the old days, when I was running root, you know, when I was running it in a non-root environment, you know, what I was doing is I was, I was uh, basically, uh, you know, no hupping it, you know, in the background as a background process, you know, and then you know letting it go. Um, you know, you could certainly run it within a Docker container. There's no reason why you could. Um, it it should run fine within Docker. Um, and there's probably a Docker container out there for it. You know, if you look for it, it's probably there. Um, you know, so, you know, you could definitely do it that way. Um, or within a VM, you know, if, if you don't want to, you know, if, if you don't want to run it on your, on bare metal, you can do it, you can do that too. You know, it's, <laughs> what I want to see them is I want to see them support, you know, type two, type one hypervisors, you know, rather than running, you know, on VirtualBox. You know, I, I like to see them support QEMU. Um, you know, I think that would be better. I think they supported VirtualBox in the beginning because that was what people were familiar with. So, um, but uh, anyway, anything else? Any other questions you might have before I, before you kick me off or? Oh, no, we never kick you off, Doug. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You might you might tell me to stop talking since I talk too much, but you know. before we do that, we always say, "Hey, Peter, can you stop the recording?" Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, um, and what before we were talking, you know, uh, I know you saw this is on a completely different subject. So um, you all saw the MX Linux distro that I was using, um, Ted and Peter. Uh, I, I think I'm going to commit myself to a MX Linux um, demo for maybe you can put me on the schedule for that. Um, I'd yeah. like to. I'd like to do that. Um, I really like MX Linux. It's really an interesting distribution. Uh, I thought it was a Debian, uh, you know, what I call it, based on Debian. On on on, I thought they took Debian and then uh, kind of you know made a Linux distro 
you know, kind of modified it, but that's not what they did. They actually use the Debian packages and then build their distribution from the base up, which is interesting. So it's more Debian compatible than, than a, an offshoot of, of actual Debian, which is interesting. So, um, uh, but it's got a lot of really neat features, uh, especially off the boot menu, off the Grub boot menu, which is amazing. Like being able to load the entire operating system in RAM, in a RAM disk off of a USB stick and then remove the stick and then do what you want and then come back and then stick the stick in and then shut down and it will sync everything back up with the stick so you can walk away, which is kind of, I've never seen that on a distro before, which is kind yeah, of cool. cool. Yeah, yeah, what, so. What month do you want to present that? Well, uh, what this is uh, February, so uh, I don't know what, what's what's on your schedule. Is anyone committed to anything uh, other so than the me? next thing on our schedule? Is Peter's going to talk about OBS? Which oh, cool! Peter turns his camera on and kind of get a preview of what OBS. No, so he can't. Okay. All right. So OBS is the Open Broadcast. Ah, oh, yes, OBS. Right. You know, and, it's interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So uh, yeah, yeah. Why don't you tell us about it, Peter? You know, Peter, uh, thank you for doing that on OBS because that is actually very topical with my stuff at work. Um, you know, with Zoom and all, we're, I'm actually using a commercial product called ManyCam, M-A-N-Y-C-A-M, which is kind of similar to OBS, uh, but it's, you know, it's a commercial product. Uh, it's actually quite, quite amazing what it can do, but I like OBS, uh, especially, you know, one of the things that, that, that I wanted to do is to give our AV technicians the ability to have more of a studio control over the video going into Zoom meetings, and OBS could provide that. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, very interested to see to see OBS. I, don't, I haven't used OBS that much, so very cool. Yeah, sure. 